God. John 17, verse number 1. Amen. And we're going to read this. Uh, I'm just going to read this out loud real quick. John 17, verse number 1. The Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Lord, as we take time to look at the word of God, Lord, and we take time to study the word, and Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we get a chance to hear the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that I have to preach God's word. I pray that, Lord, tonight that you would be honored and you would be glorified. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive me for where I fail you, Lord. I, you know that, Lord, I failed you this even, even uh, Lord, this past week. Lord, even today, Lord, I failed you in many ways. Lord, I, Lord, know that I'm a sinner, Lord, and that I fail. And, Lord, I ask that in spite of that, Lord, you would use me now, Lord, to do, the, do your work, God. May you, Holy Spirit, fill me and use me in a special way that only you can do, God. And would you speak to the hearts of the people. Lord, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Pray now that you would encourage our hearts, bless the message, bless the service, and then, Lord, may we be able to say it's been good to be in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, so much. We love you. We thank you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I announced this morning the title of my message would be, When Jesus Prayed for You. When Jesus Prayed for You. Let me start by saying I believe that one of, the great, one of the greatest things that a Christian can do is pray. Jesus gave us that example. Jesus was a man of prayer. And I believe that Jesus made much of prayer because as a Christian, we ought to make much of prayer. The word pray in all of its forms is found 508 times in the Bible. I believe God wants us to pray. You're commanded as a Christian to pray. Jesus said to even pray for your enemies. Amen. But I believe that God wants us to specifically pray for each other as He did. Jesus would pray for His disciples. Jesus would pray, and we see many times how Jesus prayed, and much of His time was spent praying for others. I believe that our prayer life should be spent much in prayer for others than for ourselves. Too often we spend more of our time praying for what we need and not for what others need. Too much of our prayer time becomes selfish more than it does become a time to pray for other people and their hurts. Amen. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for what we need, but I believe that our focus should not be just on what we need. Amen. I believe that praying for one another shows your love for the brethren. Jesus here in our portion of Scripture, we're going to find out in John chapter 17, He prayed for us, but He did that because He loved us. I believe that praying for each other shows our love for each other. Many are quick to criticize. Many are quick to slander. But very few pray for those that they slander. Very few pray for those they criticize. Amen. I believe that most difficulties in the church would be a lot less and most problems would be a lot less if there was a lot more prayer. Amen. I believe that many husbands and wives have difficulties from time to time because they don't pray for each other as they ought. I believe many people are offended because they don't pray for each other as they ought. I believe that a lot of times many people are offended even at the church house because we don't spend time in prayer. Amen. Number two, I believe it shows our love for God. When we spend time in prayer, we'll see that Jesus did it out of a love for us, but He also did it out of a love for the Lord, out of a love for His Father. When you're willing to pray, that means you're willing to humble yourself before the Lord and you desire to know God. The more you pray, I believe, the greater your love for the Lord will be. Now, Jesus is our example, 
And in this portion of Scripture, we're going to find an example in Him and in His prayer that He gives to us, but it was a prayer for us. Each and every one of us in this room, Jesus prayed for. Even though 2,000 years ago Jesus lived and died and rose again, but while He was on this earth, He had you on His mind. And it's evident in this verse. Look at verse number 20. The Bible says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Every one of us in this room, Jesus prayed for today. If you're here in this room, if you're born again, Jesus took time to pray. You realize in chapter 18, Judas comes and betrays the Lord, and Jesus goes through the difficult process of the cross. The last thing that Jesus prayed for was us. Amen. What a thought. The God of heaven took time to not only die for you, but to pray for you. How much time do we take to pray for each other? Amen. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you and I. Amen. But I'd like to notice what Jesus prayed about. When Jesus prayed for us, when Jesus took time apart from everything that was going on to pray for you and I, what did He ask God for? What did He ask the Father for? Well, I believe we're going to see some things, and I'd like to take you through them very quickly. I won't keep much of our time. Very brief message, but very challenging. You'll notice in these when we go here, starting in verse number 9, that there are two specific areas that Jesus addresses in His prayer. He addresses the inward man, and He addresses the outward man. Let's find out. Verse number 9, the Bible says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine. Stop there real quick and just say that Jesus prayed for those that would be born again. Look how he says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. Jesus took time to pray for us as born again Christians specifically. Amen. For those that are lost, this prayer does not refer to. But when they are born again, this is for them. Because Jesus, all-knowing, knew who would be saved. Amen. Now, we don't believe in predestination, but we do believe that Jesus knew everything, and even then He knew who would be born again and spent time in prayer for those. Let's keep going. Verse 10, And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world... And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. I believe the first thing that Jesus prayed for was that we would have security of salvation. Realize Jesus asked the Father that He would keep us through His name. John 10, 27 says this, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of My hand. My Father which gave them Me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of My Father's hand. I and My Father are one. I believe Jesus prayed this to remind us that when He left, He did not leave us hopeless. Jesus asked the Father that He would keep us through His name. You are eternally secure tonight. If you're saved, born again, you've trusted Jesus as your Savior and only way to heaven. Not only does Jesus have you, but the Father has you. Because I think that we forget often that the Trinity is involved in our salvation. Jesus saves us, the Father keeps us, and the Spirit indwells us. Amen. Jesus asked the Father that He would keep us through His name. 
We are eternally secure. In fact, you're so eternally secure that when you slip into death, you're going to slide right into heaven. What a love that the Lord has. He wanted us to understand that when He left, He made sure that we were taken care of. But that's not all. Verse number 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep to thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So we're dealing with the inward man. Jesus is praying for the inward man, for number one, to be secure of salvation. Number two, unity of mind. He asked God that we would be one as He is. That we would be one with the Father as He is. Psalms 133 one says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Philippians 2, two Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Philippians 1.27 Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I believe God wants us to be uni unified in our mind. We should be in agreement. Amen. God doesn't want discord among the brethren. Jesus prayed that we would be in unity. We would be in one accord. Amen. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. I believe in our church, our goal ought to be to reach the city for Jesus Christ. And as a church, we must be unified in that goal. Too many Christians get distracted and allow the devil to get them off focus. But we should all fall behind the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God through the pastor. And in one mind, we strive together. That means we fight. We work. Amen. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. We must also be unified in our doctrine. We must understand what we believe from God's word and agree. Amen. That we believe God's word is a perfect and pure word. See what happens is the devil tries to get into a church. The devil tries to get into God's people and cause doubt. And cause them to be swayed with every wind of doctrine. Jesus prayed that we would be of one mind. That we would be one as the Father. We must be unified in our doctrine. Knowing what we believe and from God's word who Jesus is. But we must also be unified in our standards. We must be unified in our standards of trying to be closer to Jesus and farther from the world. Because we don't want the world, the flesh, and the devil to creep in. We want God to be glorified. We want God to get the honor and the glory and the praise. Amen. In a church, it can be very easy for the devil to creep in and cause us to get distracted and cause us not to be in unity with one another. In our spirits, we may come and smile, but in our spirits we know that there's not unity. That's what happens when sometimes if we're not careful, we can get bitter. We can get bitter at God. We can get bitter at each other. We can get bitter at the pastor. God wants us to be of one mind. Jesus prayed for that. Then look, verse 13. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The last thing here dealing with the inward man is to be joyful in spirit. See, Jesus prayed that his joy might be in you. He wants his joy to be fulfilled in yourself. See, Jesus did not intend for us to be sad Christians. Amen. Too many Christians are sad. Too many born-again ch children of God are walking around, look like they've been sucking on persimmons. Jesus wants us to be happy. Jesus wants you to put a smile on. Jesus wants you to be glad that you're saved. Jesus wants you to be glad that you're born again tonight and that heaven is your home. Be glad you're in a good church. That's why we took time and we took testimonies because I want to remind us that God wants us to be joyful 
in church. Amen? It's really sad when a Christian doesn't smile. Amen? We rock around this old world. No wonder they don't want to come to church. No wonder people don't want to get saved because sometimes as Christians we walk around pouting. Get that poochy lip disease. <laughs> Jesus wants us to be joyful. Amen. Do you have the joy of Jesus this morning? Or this evening, excuse me. I'm mixed up in my time zone here. Jesus wants us to be joyful. Jesus wants you to be glad. As a pastor, when you come to church, I want you to enjoy church. I want it to be joyful. I try to make it so it can be joyful. You know why? Because I want you to understand that God doesn't want you to live down in the dumps. He wants you to live high on the mountain. Too often we're not joyful. Too often we come sad. Now this is different when, yes, when we've lost loved ones. Yes, sometimes sorrow comes because of difficulties that come in our life. But see, joy is not a result of happenings. Joy is a result of Jesus. Doesn't matter what comes your way, you can have the joy of Jesus. Doesn't matter what trial hits you. Doesn't matter what difficulty you may face. Jesus prayed that you would have joy. Amen. And it's possible to have joy. You may hit a wall where you may not know where to turn, but you can look up and smile and know that God's in control. If you've never hit that wall, you don't really understand. But one day, each of us will. God will bring you to a point one day when you think you can't even smile, and then that's when joy sets in. God wants you to be joyful. Let's keep moving. Verse number 15. These last things deal with the outward man. We dealt with the inward man. Now we're going to deal with the outward man. Jesus prayed in verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but, thou, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. When Jesus was talking to God, the Father, you imagine Jesus is praying. And I put in my mind an idea. Put your name in there that when Jesus was praying and asking the Father, that he had your face in mind. He had your name on his heart. Father, I know they'll be saved. I know they'll be alive. 2,000 years later, keep them from the evil. You know, it's sad because most Christians, instead of trying to stay away from evil, we run to it. God wants, Jesus prayed that we would stay away from the evil that's in the world. God want, Jesus prayed that God would keep us from the evil hearts of men. Amen. There are those out there that are not intended for good. This is a prayer from Jesus to keep you safe. God knew when we would go soul winning that there would be evil intended on His people. This was a prayer to keep us from that evil. Now we'll be persecuted... But that's something that God allows. But Jesus asked that we would be kept from the evil. Jesus asked that God would protect us from the devil and from those that would seek to hurt you and I as a Christian. Amen. Jesus asked God to keep us from the evil on the internet. To keep us from the evil on the TV. To keep us from the evil on the radio. From the evil in the video games and those things that the devil tries to pour his... His power into. Jesus asked that God would keep us from that evil. That the Father would keep us from what that would destroy our homes and our marriages and our very lives. Have you kept yourself from the evil? Have you kept your family from that evil? Too often, as I said, Christians, instead of keeping ourselves from the evil in the world, we like to kind of dance with it. We like to kind of mess with it and taste with it. Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou, that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. See, the answer for a Christian is not that God just come back. 
That wasn't Jesus' prayer. Jesus didn't want you to go to heaven. Jesus wanted you to be a light. Jesus said, Father, would you just keep them from that evil? Don't take them away from it, because there are those that they can be a light in a dark world to, but just keep them from it. Let me say this, the more sin that you involve, the less your light will shine. Jesus wants you to stay away from the evil, so that your light may shine before men. Then look, verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The next thing that Jesus asked for is that we would be sanctified through truth. The word of God is truth. The word of God is the only truth that you and I have in this wicked world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is the Word. This is our truth. Sanctify is just talking about separation. Sanctify is talking about sancti- is separating from one thing to a purpose set apart for. God wants to sanctify His children for a purpose. How do, but we are sanctified through truth. We are set apart through truth. The Word of God is what will set you apart from the world for the Lord. How do we know what we are to separate from? How do we know what we are to be and for the Lord? Through God's Word. You say, what does God expect of me as a Christian? Read the Word of God. The more you read God's Word, the more that God will sanctify you. The more that you spend time in the Word of God, the more that God will pull on your heart to get farther away from the world and closer to Jesus. God's intention was not that you just stay away from the evil, but that you would get closer to Him. Because, see, sanctification, a lot of times we we focus in sanctification, and listen to me here, A lot of times we focus on just the separation, how separated we are. But we forget that when God, He wants to separate us so that we can be closer to Him. The idea for separation is not to be prideful and say, well, I'm more separated in my standards than you are. The idea for separation and sanctification is that each and every one of us would draw closer to the Lord. God wants us to be sanctified. Yes, it's important to stay away from the world, but it's because we want to be closer to Jesus Christ. All through the years, my parents raising us in a Christian home, I remember when they were ridiculed for having certain standards. Listen to me, you be a Christian long enough and you put some standards up, a wall, and you separate yourself for God, you're going to get ridiculed, my friend. You're going to get ridiculed. You're going to get slandered by this old world, even sometimes by fellow Christians. And I remember my parents being ridiculed for their standards. But you know what? My dad would take us home and say, children... We don't do it to put a boast up and say, well, look how separated we are. Look how great Christians we are. He'd say, we do it because we love God. The purpose for you to be separated and the reason we preach that separation is not because I want to say, wow, everybody, look at Amazing Grace Baptist Church in Wichita, Kansas. Boy, what great Christians we are. The purpose we preach then is because I want you to be closer to Jesus Christ. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. The more you draw closer to God, the more that God will draw closer to you. The closer you are to the world, listen, the farther you'll be from God. But this is not just talking about physically. 
That's why Jesus dealt with the inward man first. You see, it starts in your spirit. It starts here. Because when you have the joy of Jesus Christ, that will cause you to separate and stay separated. I've met many a Christians that have all the standards in the world. But they're as far from God. It's like Jesus said of the Pharisee. The Pharisee came and prayed and said, God, thank you that I am not like this publican. And the publican knelt and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, God heard the Pharisee. Or God didn't hear the Pharisee, but God heard the publican. And I believe we should be separated, but it starts in your spirit. It starts here. Do it for God. Don't do it for the pastor. Don't do it for the just, just, just to do it's sake or to be able to hold up a flag and say, look at me. Do it because you want to be closer to Jesus Christ. I remember a song always speaks to my heart. The song talks, the song says in the chorus, how much is too much to give for the Savior? How much is too much to give to my Lord? Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you, can Jesus ask too much of you? Is there too much that God could ask? Is there anything in God's Word that when you read or when you hear God's Word or when you study the Word of God that you would say, God, that, that's, that's too much to ask. I can't do that. Then my, my friend, can I point you back to an old rugged cross? Can I remind you that He gave everything? so that you can even have the opportunity to be saved. And when Jesus asks us to stay away and love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, is that too much to ask? Jesus prayed that we would sanctify through truth. Well, how important. Sometimes we, sometimes even other churches have looked in at a church that is separated for God. And they think, man, boy, they're wasting their time. Can I remind you that I promise you, you'll be closer to God than you've ever been before when you sanctify through truth. Verse 23. Well, we'll start in verse 22. It says, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. I believe that Jesus wanted us to be soul winners. You see how he says that, it says, And that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Jesus prayed that we would live such a way that the world would know that he came. We ought to be busy spreading the gospel. But our lives ought to be so that even as we live and we walk out in this wicked old world that we're so different that, Jesus can, that people can look and say, something different about them. Something different about that person. You ever had anybody ask you that before? My wife and I have been walking through the store, had many people stop and ask us and say, or tell us and compliment us. They say, you have a great family. Y'all are young, but they would tell us all the time, and they still do as we walk through Walmart and people see us, they, they compliment us all the time. And you know, we don't try to take any of the glory. I tell them, I say, well, praise the Lord. And they look at you, huh? I tell them, say, it's what God did, not me. You see, God wants to sanctify you through truth so you can be closer to Him but also so that you could be a light to this world 
and they say, you know, something different. Let me ask you, could somebody look at you and tell you were a Christian? When you go home, when you go to work, when you live your daily life, can they look at you and say, boy, they're different. If not, then we're not an answer to prayer. God asked us to be sanctified, that we would be made perfect, that the world may know that thou hast sent him, that, thou hast sent, that God has sent Jesus. You see, God wants the world to know the gospel. And sometimes the only Bible people read is you and I. Can they tell a difference? Amen. We ought to be so winners. And then the last thing, verse 24. I think this is probably one of my most favorite parts of all. He said, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus asked in verse 24, He said, Father, I would that they would be with me. We get to spend eternity in heaven, but one day we will get to be right beside Jesus because Jesus asked the Father that we could be where He is and behold His glory. God's given you eternal life and you've escaped the punishment of hell. But one day you'll get to walk past the host of heaven. You'll get to walk past the angels. You'll get to walk past Gabriel and Michael. And you'll get to stand right next to the Savior. Why? Because Jesus asked if you could. He asked that you would be where He is. Now, He doesn't want us to be taken out of the world right now. He wants us to be a light but He wants us to be with Him. Jesus loved you so much that He wants you to be with Him as soon as possible. As soon as He can, Jesus said, God, would you let them be with me? He said, Father, it's because only the Father knows when Jesus is coming. And Jesus said, Father, will you let them come? See, Jesus wants us with Him. We get to spend eternity at the feet of Jesus. What a joy. But can I ask you, when you spend eternity at the foot of Christ, will He be able to look at you and say, you know, you were an answer to prayer? Will you have been sanctified through truth? Will we have been kept from the evil? Yes, God does that, but are we going to spend the time that it takes to be the soul winner that we ought to be and be more of an answer to prayer. And then I like the last part there. And he says, And the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. God loves you tonight. And he ends his, Jesus ends his prayer. He says, Listen, everything I've prayed for, I do it because I love you. Everything God asks of you, He asks you because He loves you. That's why I said, is there anything too much that Jesus can ask? Because He loves you today. Is there something that God could ask you to do that you'd say, God, it'd be too much? Well, Jesus asked it, and He said that He loved you. And He wants His love to be in you. And Jesus is in us. He says, and I in them. Boy, what a joy. Jesus prayed for you 2,000 years ago. Amen. As we take time and we think about that, how much of an answer to prayer do we want to be?
Don't take it lightly. Don't take it as a, well, I'm glad Jesus did that. The God of heaven took a special time to pray for you because He loves you tonight. And as in the future, when we get more into God's Word, and in the future as we serve God together, may we remind ourselves that all we do is for the Savior. But notice it's for those that are born again. See, there are those that this prayer does not apply to. Do you have a family member lost tonight? Well, look, John 17, 2 and 3. I love these verses. It says, As thou hast given him, talking about the Father giving Jesus, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus wants people to know Him. But this is only for those that know Him. That means not even sometimes people in church this will apply to. Because not everybody in church is born again. Because being born again is, as it says, that Jesus will give eternal life. Only Jesus can give eternal life. God gave Jesus the power to give eternal life. Not anybody else. Are you born again tonight? Does this prayer apply to you? If so, let it it ring in your heart and remind yourself of what Jesus asked, that we would be that way. Amen. That we would glorify the Father through us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, sure do love you.